Hi, hi. Welcome back to another episode of Healthy Wisdom Series with Dr. Jen Chen. Today, we're going to explore a new mini-series on the wisdom of culture. So here's a question that's puzzled me for many years. What is culture? I mean, I have a vague idea about what it means to me, but I was wondering if you also had the same question in your mind. Well, I decided to Google it the other day, and you won't believe what I discovered. It turns out even the experts can't come up with a definitive definition. And so the different ways of explaining it range from super vague definitions like complex whole of a society to very detailed ones like patterns of human behavior that includes ideas, beliefs, values, and ways of making a living. So what I kind of boiled it down to after seeing like 20 different definitions was I tried to make it a comprehensive yet simple way of defining culture. And to me, it is this. The way we see and do things through learned patterns of perception. So here's the thing. Each one of us grew up with a set of values and beliefs, traditions, customs, rituals, food, environment, and language. And we have a set of conscious and unconscious versions of these values, ideas, um, and attitudes that shape our behavior. And these qualities are transmitted or passed on from one generation to the next. So let me take you through an example, through my own um, sort of version of what I would call culture. So I would consider myself a culture mashup, like a mashup of songs of that sort. I was born in Taiwan. I grew up in Argentina and then moved to Canada and then spent a good number of years of uh, of that time in North America um, in California. So I'm technically a Taiwanese, Argentinian, Canadian, North American. So I remember back in my teens, Um, that I kind of faced an identity crisis of some sorts. Because first of all, um, remember when we broke down the word crisis, there's some challenges um, as well as opportunities in that type of situation. And so in terms of my identity, I felt that, you know, I was really confused because of this mixture of cultures that I had been raised with. Um, And so I, I found that I couldn't fully identify with any one particular culture because throughout different stages of my life, I had different types of cultures and environments and different uh, people around me, different values, different customs. So I remember for um, because I was in Taiwan for I was born there and um, we basically only lived there for five years. So other than being born there and sort of, you know, maybe only being conscious of my surroundings for about two years, um, I really couldn't remember enough. So I had to. So I had a lot to learn about the Taiwanese culture. And then so when we moved to Argentina, um, we lived there for about four years. And so we didn't stay long enough to really soak up all the culture. We had little itty bits of it, you know, so I couldn't quite really fully grasp, um, I guess, not looking Argentinian because, I mean, I was Asian on the outside. But I had, you know, the hand gestures. I mean, for people who know me, they know that when I speak, I'm actually very animated and I move my hands a lot. And that actually... I believe comes from the Argentinian side of me. Um, And I'm very passionate when I'm speaking. So that's, I believe, a very Argentinian aspect as well. It's very Latin American, very, um, very like passionate, exciting um, type of persona. And then with my Canadian side, um, because I've lived here for more than 30 years, Um, I've lived here the longest. Um, However, in Canada, we are so multicultural that it's almost hard to identify as well because I am 
again, like I said, I look Asian on the outside, but I have picked up a lot of the Western um, sort of habits, uh, values, ways of thinking. Um, and hence, if you've ever heard of the term banana, you'll know what it means. You are yellow on the outside and kind of white on the inside. I hope, you know, nobody kind of interprets that as, you know, sort of um, being racially biased or anything like that. But it's just a term that um, us Asians who have grown up in Western cultures have been labeled. So that was my confusion. But, you know, I, I, I remember writing a paper back in uh, high school because of this identity, like I, you know, in, in when you're in your teenage years, you kind of struggle with, you know, fitting in and belonging. And I really felt like I really didn't belong in any group in particular. So I really, I, I sat down and I remember actually, it was my application to one of the Ivy League schools. And there was a question in there that, that, um, that prompted, you know, tell us a little bit more about yourself and what makes you unique. And I thought to myself, huh, you know, that was when I really kind of first started thinking about my culture and my identity. And um, as I was writing or gathering ideas, I, re I, I really kind of came to the sense that, wow, actually, the mashup of cultures that I grew up with actually makes me really unique. And so what I decided to do was kind of you know, sort of take it from the perspective of what if I embraced that and used it to my advantage? And so I thought, wow, you know, like not many people can say that they've lived in so many different places as they're growing up. I mean, other than diplomats and, you know, people who are very well traveled, I really don't think people have that opportunity. Um, we were we were fortunate enough because I guess, um, as Taiwan wasn't recognized as a country, there were very limited places where you could actually immigrate to. And I think Central and South American countries at the time in the 80s um, were opening up their doors to immigration because um, I guess in one way uh, it was a financial uh, sort of uh, win for them. And for those smaller, uh, I guess, uh, we, we came from a Formosa island. So um, for, the, for the Formosan island people, it was a benefit because then we can get out of uh, the country and, or what we believed is a country and uh, be able to kind of explore different types of cultures and, you know, uh, that type of thing. So anyway, so the biggest gift I boiled it down to the biggest gift that I'd received from living in all these different places was actually language. I mean, learning all these tips and different types of languages allowed me to not just have the ability to speak and be in uh, different cultures, but it's allowed me to, I guess, gain a different set of skills. And I thought, wow, that's almost like a superpower that I gained because in Taiwan, I remember my parents and my godparents and, you know, everybody around me who saw me growing up, they said, I actually learned to speak Taiwanese before I learned to speak Mandarin, which is interesting because Taiwanese is like sort of a more native language to um, our, 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 um, our culture. And uh, Mandarin is sort of like, it's a very uh, broad based um uh, dialect, but um, most people in Taiwan, if you know how to speak Taiwanese, that really kind of brings you down to, you know, the core of um, being uh, part of that, uh, that society. And when we moved to Argentina, I remember I had to learn Spanish from scratch. And so that was kind of interesting because Spanish was a completely different uh, structure and it was a really romantic language, so it was really fun, but it was a challenge learning the double R's. And, you know, I remember having to practice by gurgling water. I mean, we can go into like how to learn a new language, you know, in another episode. But it was really interesting how we, we, we had to kind of really um, kind of buckle down and uh, work on it uh, syllable by syllable. So um, then 
Uh, in Argentina, we had very, very minimal English in our classes, but we did have some exposure to it. So we knew how to say, hello, how are you? Thank you. Very, very basic things. And so when we moved to Canada, um, we had to learn English. So at this point in time, I had three languages under my belt. But then now I had to learn another new language, which was English. And although structurally uh, there were some similarities because they all kind of derived themselves from uh, Latin, but uh, there were still some uh, some grammatical differences between English and Spanish. So it did make it a little bit challenging. Um, so once I learned English and mastered that, it's interesting because in Canada back in the 19, late 1980s, early 90s, French um, is, is and still will be, um, albeit I, I find, you know, more languages are kind of like coming into Canada. But at that point in time, French was um, still very, very uh, prevalent and um, it was taught in school quite a bit. So French um, was the next language that I actually uh, plunged myself into. And I had a very good teacher at the time and she kind of inspired me to really want to learn the language. She really grew the love for this language. And interestingly enough, French and Spanish actually have a lot of uh, similarities in terms of how you, you know, how you like conjugate a verb and stuff like that. So to me, actually uh, learning French wasn't as hard as learning English. And so, Starting from Taiwanese, then going into Mandarin, and then Spanish, and then in Canada, I learned English and French. Culture-wise, there weren't very many Taiwanese people in Canada. And so, interestingly enough, I picked up a new language um, as well, like on top of that, another Asian language, I would say, because back in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, the sort of predominant Asian population here in, in Vancouver uh, was from Hong Kong. And so they speak Cantonese. And I remember um, our parents had a lot of challenges trying to buy uh, from the butcher in Chinatown um, a certain cut of meat because we didn't speak Cantonese. And most other people who were um, returning customers and their uh, frequent customers of that butcher shop, they knew the butchers and they spoke their language. And so we were very often the last to pick. And I remember uh, standing there fuming because we had a number, but then our number kept skipped, kept getting skipped over because somebody else who came in knew the butcher and just literally cut the line and went right in front of us and was able to pick up what they needed and they left. So I remember I vowed to myself that I was going to learn the Cantonese language and that next time I'm going to walk in, I'm going to take my number because I'm polite, but I am going to be able to use and command that language. And so I did. So it did take time, but you know, that could be for our sort of like a language um, episode. However, I actually gained the superpower because now I've got six different languages under my belt. And it's amazing because it not only gave me the tools to communicate with a broader range of people, but I also found a personality change. I was able to actually become more assertive. I was actually more confident and I became more comfortable in my own skin. So here's my question to you. What aspect of your culture will you embrace and use to your advantage? And I'd like you to think really hard about this because this is something that if you can use to your advantage and embrace whatever you feel is weak or not necessarily a superpower in your culture and you turn that around and turn it into a skill or a tool or a superpower, as I've said, then your world can really change. And I'd like you to take a few minutes of your day to think about this. And when you do, I'd love for you to comment on my Facebook post for episode eight. I mean, let's start a conversation and see if we could learn that superpower quality about ourselves. All right, healthy wisdomers, if you like this episode, I'd love for you to share it 
and please subscribe, follow me.